buongiorno. And uh, come stai? Um, this is only Italian I can speak, so <laughs> uh, sorry, let me speak in English today. And uh, while I, I didn't understand what she said about me, but uh, yeah, she must have said something nice to me. Anyway, uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this fascinating event, uh, this first time to Bologna. I've been to Italy many times, but uh, for some reason I've never been to uh, Bologna. So, I really enjoy uh, walking around the city and the food culture just yesterday. But, uh, and also, yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting to Bologna and also particularly Paola for inviting me to this event. Um, so, uh, yeah, first of all, maybe I need to apologize because I am not such a uh, nip pop person. So, the first speaker should be a more nip pop kind of person, I think. But, uh, and also my talk, I'm not quite sure how my talk will fit the overall event uh, for this Nippo, because my talk is uh, kind of more critical, uh, being tried to be critically thinking of, of the circulation of the media culture of Japan or Asia, etc. But clearly, uh, as the title showed, uh, I'm trying to think about the more regional uh, East Asian media cultural connections. And of course, Bologna is also part of this. I would say Bologna is not ge geographically located in East Asia, but uh, I think anyone interested in uh, culture and uh, social issues in East Asia, uh, you are part of East Asia media cultural connection. And so I appreciate it if you listen to my talk by relating my, what I, I'm saying to the, uh, what you are doing here. Uh, in terms of consumption, production of various culture relating to Japan or others. Um, okay. So uh, my talk uh, is, uh, first of all, uh, always uh, I think it is important to locate, uh, situate the, any studies of uh, Japanese or other East Asian popular culture in a wider context of a globalization. And otherwise, we lose, uh, lose sight of a very important theoretical issues uh, that is happening in many parts of the world. And so, uh, so yeah, in the last 15 years or 20 years, we have observed the rise of a so-called East Asian media culture, including Japan, also Korea, and Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, now more India, for example. And also, uh, it's not just you know, consumed within the nation. It circulates internationally now. So Bologna is, of course, part of that. And, uh, but uh, what is more, uh, I think, significantly new is uh, its circulation within the region. So East Asian culture uh, circulates within this region. And also people living in this region uh, mutually consume other culture coming from other parts of East Asia. I think this is uh, quite historically significant, uh, I think, development. Uh, because it uh, brought up a new kind of connection and also new kind of a dialogue. And uh, it shows the uh, so-called media culture's uh, capacity to promote uh, cross-border uh, dialogue. And so uh, my talk is mostly concerned with this kind of cross-border dialogue, how we, what is going on. And also then we need to think about the, how we can uh, further develop the already existing uh, potentials of a cross-border dialogue. Uh, developed by the recent rise of uh, uh, international circulation of media culture. So, uh, so my talk today is first briefly I explain the uh, new, very significant uh, development of, in terms of a cross-border dialogue in East Asia, and then we, I move to the main point of my talk today, which is the kind of uh, something. Uh, some kind of strong governance, I, I would say, of a media cultural connection going on. Uh, in a way, not to well promote the existing uh, uh, cross-border dialogue. And then, uh, being critical to, the, to these issues, I think uh, we can think about how we can uh, uh, further develop the cross-border dialogue. So this is my um, basic uh, ideas. And so, yeah, just brief, uh, I don't know how much you're familiar with other Korean or other East Asian pop culture. And so, this is just a tiny, mostly Korean, these are Korean. 
あそうやガーズジェネレーション少女時代はフィルムリーセントフィルムあコリアあそうディーザーもジャパニーズサイドディーザーナインティーズアンダーリーセントリーもディーズユノウィメンズパティカリファッションマガジンはキュートカルチャーはイフユライニッポップカルチャーオオオソエンジョイサーキュレイインイーストエジア I think even more uh, uh, extensively uh, compared to Euro American I think uh, context and so these uh, many scholars uh, argued in the last 10 or 15 years this kind of rise of media culture from East Asia and also circulation within East Asia uh, show the kind of a decentralization or deep if you like Americanization or Westernization of a media culture and uh, one of which uh, important issue is uh, for example if you look at so called, we know very well culture, uh, there is no pure culture. Culture is always you know, some mixing up some other element coming from other parts of the, uh, you know, uh, the world or within society, many cultures uh, join together to mix up or hybridize themselves if you like. But uh, uh, I think these kind of you know, new development in the last 15 years uh, are uh, many scholars to consider the so called issue of cultural hybridization not in terms of, uh, you know, non-West appropriates the Western culture. So this is a very long-standing paradigm uh, to study cultural hybridization. Always uh, many scholars think American culture, uh, you know, cross the boundary, national boundary to other parts, non-Western country, how people in non-Western country uh, hybridize this culture. But now, now what's going on is, uh, this is also uh, very uh, still going, but uh, at the same time, what's going on is uh, cultural hybridization occurring within East Asian culture as well. Although this East Asian culture, if you like, if you, uh, I think uh, I would say, uh, cannot be so you know, essentially Japanese or Korean or anymore. It is more inevitably more, uh, you know, part of a global culture, uh, adapting a various kind of uh, cultural format of a media popular culture. Um, one such kind of uh, example, do, do you know maybe Hanayori Dango uh, meet as garden? So this is a one be, tiny but very interesting case of uh, inter-Asia cultural fusion. So original Japanese comic series adapted by Taiwanese producer in the dramatized series. And then related to Japanese uh, TV product uh, company, uh, TBS, uh, belatedly uh, uh, made their own uh, Japanese version of TV dramas. Because Liu Xinhuan became so popular outside Taiwan, in many parts of our East and Southeast Asian countries. And then, uh, finally, as Korea also remade uh, uh, this kind of uh, new TV series. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, these kind of, you know, uh, text, textuality of these uh, four uh, versions of Hanayori Dango or Liu Xinhuan, uh, you will see that how you know, some element mixed up, some, some element are kind of dropped out. So this is show some tiny examples of uh, uh, cultural hybridization occurring within East Asia, and also uh, you will see how uh, media culture industries within East Asia actually co-work uh, together uh, to uh, produce. This is, we should not think you know, this kind of hybridization in terms of uh, Taiwan versus Japan versus Korea. Uh, so it's a more mixed, a more complex, uh, complicated relationship among these uh, media text and also media culture industries. And so it is uh, difficult for us to clearly demarcate Japan, Korea, Taiwan in this sense. So I think this is a very important uh, uh, point. Okay. So should I stop or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just 10 minutes or something. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so the other issue, uh, as I said, in terms of uh, cross-border dialogue, I think what's uh, happening with us, we, if you like, we can say uh, we are observing the development of a trans-Asian so-called cultural public sphere. So maybe, you know, public sphere is a, a term coined by Habermas. It is a kind of you know, where space where people join together to discuss uh, some important issue of uh, economy, politics, or society, culture, uh, on the equal term. But uh, culture public sphere is uh, more uh, important because it uh, involves not just a rational argument, but also more affect or emotional engagement by consuming various media texts. And I think this is something going on in East Asia as well. And also, of course, Bologna, too. And so, so called, uh, 
uh, for a long time, uh, East Asia media culture has long been uh, consumed mostly within the nation, within the national boundaries. But uh, in the age of globalization, of course, uh, this is no longer the case. Uh, you can say, of course, Japanese popular culture uh, crossed the national boundary even 60s, uh, 70s, uh, animation, many animation, like Tezuka Osamu, etc. But uh, this kind of uh, say cross border circulation of a popular culture became so systematic or more uh, become uh, regulated and also promoted by media culture industry since in the last 20 years or so. And then uh, we uh, observe that many kind of affective, if you like, communities uh, or affective uh, cultural public sphere. Uh, and so uh, I said, what's, uh, if we, many studies, uh, including mine, has shown that uh, uh, recent trans-Asian uh, uh, circulation of media culture, mutual consumption has brought about a new kind of a mutual understanding. Uh, it's a, as I say, this is a very historically very important. And also, uh, still, of course, uh, Japan as an ex-colonizer of other East Asian countries, including particularly Korea, Taiwan, and some part of China. And so historical issues still uh, with uh, Japan or other countries. And, uh, and, and also, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I will uh, return to this point later. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, someone, for example, uh, consuming, love to consume popular culture or TV drama, for example, uh, in Taiwan or in Korea or in Hong Kong, uh, uh, kind of perceive, consume Japanese uh, TV dramas uh, by identify themselves with the characters or storyline narratives uh, in a little bit different way uh, when they consume culture coming from, for example, United States, American culture. And so this, uh, I think, interregional media cultural flow consumption shows a new kind of a temporal or spatial perception of a similarity and the difference in East Asian context. Uh, so, because media culture circulating in the region is not, not a traditional culture, it's a more uh, modernized, urbanized, uh, popular, if you like, mass culture. And so, it, it represents various uh, kind of uh, new images of the urban life, or new uh, generation youth culture, or, or ideology, or, or uh, value orientation, or, or media kind of gender relationship, or love, romance, etc. And so, uh, so many audiences, not just, uh, also in, in Japan, many audiences of, uh, for example, <coughs> Korean TV dramas in Japan uh, perceive the similar and the different kind of uh, temporality and the difference and the modernities uh, that are produced, represented in other parts of East Asia. I think uh, this is, again, a very historically significant uh, moment uh, in which people in, living in the East Asian countries uh, uh, mutually perceive uh, the difference and similarity uh, for the uh, uh, first time in uh, modern history. Um, uh, of course, there is some uh, so-called coevalness. Coevalness, uh, you know, maybe you know, uh, this is a sense of living in the same temporality. Uh, so we are in the same. So Japan used to be maybe more industrialized. Japan used to be more upper stage of a uh, developmental time, uh, you know, axis, if you like. But uh, now, uh, due to the globalization, modernization, economic or industrialization, and uh, many people living in East Asia sh feel the sense of living in the same tem tem temporality. Uh, okay, I, I should go move. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. This is a very, very good instruction. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm very talkative, so, uh, so sorry, yeah. You have a new stereotype, Japanese are talkative, so anyway. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, yeah, shows a kind of reflexive, self-reflexive watching, listening to other East Asian media culture. So Asian media culture, consuming Asian, uh, other culture coming from East Asia, make people think uh, critically about their society, culture, even history uh, among Japan or other parts of East Asia. So I think this is a quite dialogical in this sense. Uh, so, Dialogical, not in the sense of a meeting person, in, uh, meeting someone in person to discuss something together, but uh, you know, a bike, they will not meet maybe uh, for good, but uh, still uh, they are having a dialogue with themselves 
with others and also over the issue of self-other relationship as well. So this is, I think, quite dialogic. I think uh, this is, I'm quite sure, happening in Bologna or Euro-American uh, context as well. So uh, this is a very significant development. But there are many questions whether uh, these uh, flows, new rise of East Asia media culture, or new uh, kind of circulation of media culture within East Asia, is, a, is it really contrary to the so-called Americanization or Westernization or, if, or more important, neoliberalism, marketization? That's quite questionable. Uh, so that, just, just briefly, I'm very quick. Uh, so first of all, as I said, uh, yes, maybe American culture uh, does not dominate the world as it used to be in the maybe 30 years or 20 years ago. But still, many, many researchers argued, well, OK, now many people in many parts of the world, including in Western countries, express their own specificity. But only by adopting a globally circulated mass culture format, most of which have been developed in the United States. So yeah, this is not to say still US, American culture dominates the world, no. But still, uh, we need uh, more uh, carefully you know, demarcate what is content, what is format, and how, how power relations operate in this sense. So this is not a straightforward you know, culture domination by United States anymore, of course. And also, uh, many non-Western producer people and creators are more uh, positively, actively engaged with this adaptation or indigenization of various culture forms coming from other parts of the world. Uh, so, but still, uh, some particular form uh, were developed, uh, while not others, uh, you know, uh, kind of were developed. So, what kind of you know cultural diversity being promoted uh, by uh, the through the circulation or sharing of a globally shared gro uh, mass cultural format? I think this is a quite important point uh, to think about. Not just limit to the East Asian culture. And, and in East Asian culture as well, uh, this uh, so-called, it is market-oriented. So in the last 20 years, I think we have observed the kind of a loose network of uh, so Asian mass culture, if you like. So mostly driven uh, by uh, alliance uh, of uh, media culture industries in each nation. Or maybe to uh, put it more precisely, it's not nation to nation. It's a culture industry located in the big cities. So it is a connection among the cultural industries be between, for example, Tokyo, you know, Seoul, Shanghai, Taipei, Hong Kong, what else, Singapore, yeah, uh, Bangkok, etc. cetera. Uh, so, uh, so this is, uh, I'm not saying this is all bad or something, but it has some limits uh, because it produces uh, something profitable, something marketable, and also some particular kind of culture across the national boundary and some particular culture being promoted for the circulation of uh, international uh, consumption by uh, the alliance of the media culture industry. So, and also new, new kind of culture hierarchy uh, and also marginalization of the some voices. Uh, what kind of voices included, what kind of you know, representation are not well uh, included or even marginalized in this kind of circulation. I think we need to think about that this kind of not question is quite important. Uh, even, you know, cute culture, girls' culture as well. Maybe Sharon talked more about a more critical way of uh, girls' culture in her talk today. And, and also, yes, uh, more political economy issue is uh, cultural labor, international division, and also copyright monopoly. Uh, so these are, again, not limited to the Japan or East Asia. It is global issues, right? So, but uh, we, we need to think about how these issues also operate in the East Asian media culture uh, and also flows. Uh, like I say, animation, for example. <coughs> the animation used to be uh, produced all, by in, all in Japan. But uh, in the, it's a basic manual labor moved to the cheap labor to in the Taiwan, Korea, 70s, for example. Now, they moved to China in the 90s. And now, they try to find a cheaper labor again. So, uh, yes, so I think uh, this is another issue. 
So yes, we of course we do appreciate like uh, Miyazaki Hayao film, their creativities. Uh, yes, but at the same time we need to think about uh, how Miyazaki, uh, not just Miyazaki, Japanese animation is Japanese in, in what sense, and who is involved in this kind of manual labor, and also what kind of you know uh, labor issues, and also copyright monopolies also uh, operate. So recently some British scholar says. So copyright monopoly operate as a new kind of culture imperialism because copyright is secured or monopolized by the global media conglomerate, which vertically and also horizontally integrate various kinds of uh, cultural media industries. And so, so in this sense, so again, Japan versus America versus uh, China, it doesn't make sense. So they don't care. So they work together to make profit. So, so this is something we need, uh, I think, again, go beyond the, our national imagination. Uh, so uh, the next question is uh, yeah, about the dialogue. How, how dialogic is it? As I said, it is dialogic in, in some sense, but uh, it is not in others. And so, yeah, historical issues are always uh, uh, in, in significant and a difficult matter in uh, among the Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan in particular, and also other East Asian uh, countries as well. And so uh, these kind of historical issues are not well, dialogue over this kind of issue are not well developed uh, according to the many studies, including mine. And also, uh, so not much dialogue going on over the urgent issue of a globally shared uh, problem, which may mostly, you know, political economy issue, which I just uh, raised. Uh, many kind of, uh, you know, exploitation or, or uh, promotion of particular kind of diversity. And also, uh, we are uh, observing at the same time, uh, apart from dialogue, uh, kind of so orientalist othering in East Asia. So, it's, you know, Japan has, of course, as an ex-colonizer, uh, developed uh, its own version of oriental orientalism against other East Asian nations. So, uh, as I said, so, while the yeah, Japanese economy is not quite good, and also China, Korea, other East Asian countries' economy uh, getting uh, better and better. So yeah, actually, so this kind of oriental, orientalist othering is a little bit disappearing because Japan has no power to orientalize themselves as But still, uh, this kind of logic is uh, uh, adopted. I will show some examples later. And also, uh, yes, uh, at the same time, more uh, worrying, worrying is the uh, rise of a reaction in nationalisms in many parts of East Asia. So it's a mutual, you know, othering and mutual uh, cultural nationalism. And so uh, this is how we can uh, uh, tackle with these issues are uh, very difficult, but uh, we need to do something. And also, uh, more fundamental issues are uh, maybe we need to ask to ourselves how uh, mutual understanding become deeper or complicated or de essentialized uh, in ways to do justice to cultural diversity within the nation. And so, uh, yes, Japanese popular culture, for example, well received, consumed by many parts of the world, uh, not just East Asia, uh, in Bologna or, or other parts of East uh, Euro American or non Western countries. Uh, so, uh, Japanese popular culture has. Uh, brought up a new kind of understanding of Japan, yes, I think. That's why uh, we take popular culture seriously. That's why I think we are here. So you are doing a Nippo, I'm quite sure. Uh, but uh, although uh, we should not uh, reject this kind of new possibility, new kind of development, but at the same time, we, uh, I think, should be a little bit more uh, careful, not just to celebrate what's going on. So it, of course, it always has uh, some limit. And so I think this kind of, uh, yes, uh, what kind of Japan, images of Japan you have developed by consuming Japanese culture? And uh, how it do, does justice to a cultural diversity existing within Japan, for example, various issues. So Kyoto culture, that's fine. Uh, but the Kyoto culture can tell us a lot about uh, various kind of social issues in, within Japan in terms of gender, uh, regional, urban divide and the haves and the have not, for example. And so it's not just an you know, uh, enjoyable, pleasurable object for consumption. It uh, tells us a lot 
um, it ma uh, makes us think a lot about the, these kind of uh, social issues in Japan. And also, more, these social issues are shared and, uh, in some way in Bologna or in other Euro American or Asian countries. So, I think maybe my point is it's, it is really time for each of us to be a little bit more ambitious uh, about the uh, circular, about the uh, advancement of uh, mutual understanding by consuming popular culture. I think uh, this is quite, I think, significant moment now. And also this kind of event is, of course, uh, uh, very important for that reason. And so uh, my, my point is, uh, these you know, limits uh, ki uh, kind of uh, uh, posed by what I call the development of a kind of global governance over cultural diversity. Uh, so, so first issues, as I said, kind of marketization and the reconfiguration of a cultural power and IEU connections. And so this is a more globalized, uh, but uh, this global force operate in, within East Asia. So that we are con uh, considering today. And so the uh, question is that whose voice is concerned, not shared, or marginalized in this kind of flows, uh, kind of cultural uh, market-oriented production circulation of culture. And second one is uh, uh, recently, uh, you know, cross cross-boundary flows of uh, popular culture become so banal, so mundane, so it, nothing spectacular. But uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, something to the globalization, so-called. But uh, uh, circulation of a media culture uh, outside the national boundary is being promoted in a quite inter-hyphenated, nationalized manner. Uh, I put the uh, hyphen between inter and national uh, consciously uh, because it is, it is uh, you know, international in a way to highlight the, its national origin or its national branding, if you like, uh, of a particular culture. So I think this is uh, kind of very problematic uh, in some way. Uh, again, I'm not dismissing this is or bad or something, but it has some limit uh, to promote new kind of cultural uh, dialogue. And so uh, cultural othering, library exchange uh, uh, between the nation is a one way to highlight the na nation. And also more subtle and serious issue is a kind of, this kind of internationalism uh, tend to uh, disengage with uh, local multicultural questions. Uh, again, sociocultural diversity existing within the nation. And so Japan, for example, culture of Japan or Italy highlighted. But I think it is, it is one level only. But I think there are more significant levels within the nation. And so, so if we take cross-border dialogue seriously, we need to go beyond this kind of nationalized thinking. Uh, so, but this is hard. Uh, and uh, in relation to this market-oriented internationalism, uh, we are observing the rise of a huge interest in the national branding uh, by state policies, also media culture industries, and also some uh, intellectuals who are working with uh, these uh, 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 sectors. And so again, so yes, promote, promotion of uh, you know, international circulation of culture, uh, uh, most of which, uh, which are uh, produced within the nation is fine, uh, because policy is very important. Cultural policy is very important to, uh, you know, uh, some culture survive or developed, uh, even uh, particularly in the age of uh, marketization. So market is everything now. So what kind of culture need to be you know, more promoted or, or funded for assist, uh, to, uh, to be assisted? Uh, this is a crucial question. Uh, but uh, some, sometimes, quite often, I would say, this kind of interest in national branding tend to focus on the more, little bit narrow focus national interest. It's uh, promoting economic profit, of course, by exporting more media culture or digital culture to other parts of the world. And also, or also tourism, you know. Uh, so this is, again, important to uh, make profit uh, to develop some particular new service industries or culture media industries. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, as I said, there are many, many more important issues, uh, you know, driven by globalization. And those issues are not well 
are taken by any international organization because there is no such international organization existing effectively dealing with uh, these uh, global uh, media culture issues. So nation, nation, national, nation states is still, I think, important uh, to develop this kind of issue. But still, I think, uh, this, uh, when we uh, look at uh, this kind of discourse, uh, unfortunately, I think most this discussion focus on this economic profit or uh, uh, interest in the, uh, how to enhance national image internationally, international branding. So again, this is all quite uh, shared practices in many parts of the world. So recently, for some reason, BBC over Britain uh, do a, uh, I think, regular survey over images of a national brand. And uh, so um, that's always Japan is quite in a very high, higher position. And so that's why uh, you know, some Japanese minister of foreign affairs quite happy. Right? Okay, so some, yeah. And so th that's okay, of course. So, th so that's the power of popular culture. And th that is something yeah, uh, we should take positively. But uh, at the same time, for example, uh, uh, Aso Taro, uh, who was uh, ex prime minister and uh, who used to be the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, he uh, once boasted uh, as, uh, oh, Japan is the uh, most a uh, favorable country according to this BBC survey. So we should be proud of Japan's popular culture power, national branding. Uh, so yes, that's fine. But actually he did not mention anything about the fact that two nations at the time were very critical of Japan, has showed the very negative images of Japan at the time. Do you know which countries? No, it's uh, China, Korea. Because at the time, there was a historical issue going on. So at the time, maybe you, I, I don't know you remember uh, Prime Minister Koizumi, who is a, one of the most popular prime ministers in the last, uh, in the post-war era, I think. So uh, he uh, relentlessly visited the Yasukin Shrine, which is a controversial shrine over the uh, war criminal, uh, et cetera. And also uh, textbook issues. Again, this is a kind of, uh, unfortunate kind of vicious cycle of uh, cultural nationalism uh, went on between Japan, Korea, uh, China. But uh, these issues are never mentioned. Uh, so uh, I think uh, if we just take uh, cultural policy seriously, or, or if you like, cultural diplomacy uh, term used by many, many governments, I think we, we need to uh, take uh, this kind of issue also seriously as well. Um, so OK, uh, uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So some examples, so up three, uh, yeah, so this is a cosplay you're doing tomorrow, right? Uh, unfortunately, I can't join, uh, I'm quite missing. But uh, this is, uh, you know, now in international cosplay event organized uh, every year in Japan. It's a more national event, uh, official event, uh, because they play a visit to the uh, foreign affairs uh, office. And th that's why, again, the, this kind of, you know, new kind of international uh, culture being promoted. Um, but uh, this is a film festival in Busan. So, and also this, of course, Saka. Uh, we are having a Euro 2012 this weekend. I'm very much looking forward to Spain versus Italy anyway. But uh, these issues, this, I think, shows, uh, as I said, kind of half internationalized event, spectacle, being promoted in the last 15 years. If you look at the number of film festival, uh, how it's increased in the 15 years. And also, this Kokusai Egasai, the International Film Festival, uh, tend to put national flag on some particular film. Uh, not always the case. Uh, some uh, more uh, interesting uh, film festival try not to put this one. And so, uh, this is not you know, promoted by uh, industries, market. Also, it's well consumed by ourselves. We enjoy participating in this kind of international event. Of course, Olympic is coming again. And so it is kind of, kind of a, a kind of banal sense of internationalism, or banal, inter banal nationalism, at that time coined by a British sociologist uh, uh, Billick. So banal nationalism is a kind of a, you know, mundane consumption of a national images, icon, symbol, uh, in a way to make the sense of belonging to a particular nation quite banal, so unquestionable. 
And so this kind of uh, event is uh, high develop uh, this kind of banal nationalism. So all these three is a kind of ambassador of uh, uh, national culture. Uh, this is uh, F4, maybe you don't know, uh, uh, Taiwanese idols, which uh, was stars of UC5. So they represent Taiwan for uh, promoting a Taiwanese tourism or culture. For some reason, from Japan, Kitty. And, uh, and also, maybe you know, uh, Ambassador of Qt, which uh, they were officially appointed by Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, two or three years. And so, uh, so these are uh, uh, as an example of how you know, interesting national branding become uh, widely uh, shared. Um, so this has uh, some good side, but we need also need to think about the uh, limit as well. Uh, so the so issue is, I'm not saying, you know, this you know, cute culture is nothing. Or some people in Japan say, you know, uh, cute culture is nothing, just trivia. So we should introduce more high culture, like a kabuki or tea ceremony, as, as Japan Foundation used to. Uh, they are still doing. Uh, so some people are dismissive. Of, uh, this culture is not Japanese, uh, not essential, not authentically Japanese. But that's not the case. I think this is good part of Japanese culture, as I said. But we need to take cute culture, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, shoujo culture, girl culture, more seriously, by taking a more sociological uh, or cultural studies perspective to uh, think about uh, what this culture, you know, represent uh, the various issues, not just Japan. Uh, so if uh, we think about uh, how to introduce some particular culture, uh, even the popular culture. Uh, so this is a kind of pedagogic issue. I think all of us need to uh, think seriously. How we can introduce and mutually uh, consume particular culture coming from other parts of the world, particular place, to enhance our deeper understanding of various issues or, or cultural diversity within the nation. And so this is, I think, uh, some kind of aspiration we should uh, develop. And again, this is a historical issue. And uh, uh, the, the top statement is a quote from uh, some Japanese governmental uh, report, Bunka uh, Gaiko Sokushin Suru or something, uh, in 2005. And so, uh, yes, uh, but the, this quote is uh, 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 some comment. I, I and the other, other researchers as well heard quite often. Uh, when doing a research in uh, China or Korea or Taiwan. So it is one thing to, you know, someone who loves to consume popular culture in Japan and, uh, and how they, you know, they, uh, improve their images of Japan. That's great, yeah. But uh, they are quite conscious. This, it is one thing, but it is quite another uh, to say uh, historical issue is over or popular culture smooths out a popular uh, historical issue. Uh, these are good, different issues. But sometimes these very, very simple facts tend to be not well attended to. And also, uh, more seriously, as I said, this is a, the, this right side is a vicious circle of cultural nationalism in East Asia. So uh, from uh, the Ken Nichiru is an anti-Japanese wave. Uh, this is a kind of response to a Japanese book, anti-Korean wave book. And also, uh, this is, uh, again, at the time of uh, anti-Japan demonstration in China, uh, this is a picture. And also the picture in the middle is uh, recently within Japan too, anti-Korean wave became much, much more stronger. So last November, I think, about 5,000 people gathered in front of uh, Fuji TV, which is one of the biggest commercial TV stations, uh, to make a protest against uh, Fuji TV broadcasting too much of uh, Korean TV drama. Uh, they are collaborating with Korea, so we need to get back our national uh, TV station to ours. So, so this kind of you know, vicious circles of nationalism is uh, becoming more, even more prominent. So we need to take this kind of issue seriously. You can say this is mostly driven by uh, internet, you know, internet cyber nationalism. But uh, now uh, it is uh, become uh, another stage, I think. We, we need to think seriously. Oh, oh, this is uh, another example of a cultural hazarding. In this case, in Japan, uh, it is kind of, uh, I would say, copyright orientalism. So in recently, Japanese media so repeatedly 
uh, make a coverage over the issue of how China uh, inappropriately, appropriately, uh, yeah, localized global icon, in like a Doraemon, uh, Disney, uh, and also this uh, Japanese animation. So left side is the original, the right side is a uh, uh, copy, but the uh, right side looks better. Uh, in, in, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it says Soakin, it's a very <laughs> inferior copy. But so what is uh, the issue is, uh, uh, you know, these uh, cultural, uh, if you like, appropriation or hybridization is uh, kind of very much mocked by Japanese media because it shows the kind of uh, still undemocratic state over China. It is a kind of still savage, uh, you know, nature about Chinese society or inferior uh, cultural uh, capacity over China, etc. So I think this here still Oriental Orientalism is still with us in this kind of uh, uh, representation of thinking. And also, uh, yeah, this coverage totally forgot the fact Japan did the same thing in the 60s, 70s. You know, but uh, many TV commentators are very much uh, proud, proud to be we are so more inappropriate manner. So legally, you know, uh, get a permission. But uh, you know, Japan used to not to do this as well. But, but now, uh, this kind of, again, this is show some other things about how copyright uh, imperialism are also taken for granted by Japanese uh, media as well. And so this is an image, you know, China, savage China, eat out everything of us or the globe, uh, and democratic society and very dangerous others. And last, not the least, and so this is, uh, again, the, the social cultural diversity within Japan. Particularly, I, I'm just showing the, some particular examples of, uh, of course, multicultural, ethnic, racial, multicultural diversity within Japan. And so uh, I think uh, these are good, but uh, we also need to you know, develop this kind of understanding. And also within Japan, we need, of course, uh, promote more cultural diversity to be uh, more fairly heard and respected uh, in the national uh, uh, social space. But uh, uh, this kind of you know, development, promotion, is very, very uh, much uh, strongly facilitated, while this kind of diversity is not well. So I think it's time to get a more balance or how to connect. Uh, if you like, uh, in the broader issue, you, we can say, so as I said, promotion of national popular culture is a very much global trend. But uh, many countries, including Italy, uh, including Euro America and Australia, uh, Western countries, are becoming more tight on the ethnic inflow or cultural diversity, multiculturalism within the nation, uh, attack, attack, attacking the migrant or so illegal stay here, for example. And so this kind of, you know, this quite, you know, on the one hand, many governments promote outflow of national culture, branding. But very much strict uh, on the ethno inflows or cultural diversity within the nation. So, but if you look at the more less developed country, so these are kind of reversed. So many uh, less developed countries, most culture coming from outside, they have to accept more culture from outside. But also many people of their country need to go outside to work to get a job. So this is a show, kind of new kind of cultural unevenness we are observing. So this shows, I think, the necessity for us to think about uh, cultural flows, not just in terms of our popular cultural circulation, uh, but we need to connect uh, these issues to the more uh, cultural diversity, multiculturalism, migration issue as well. Uh, this is, uh, again, a very ambitious issue, but uh, I think this is quite important if we uh, take culture seriously. And so, uh, yes, so, so, so we need to get a more balance over these kind of two kind of, uh, you know, uh, culture, culture diversities. And so, uh, to, uh, time to conclude in five minutes, right? Yeah, yes, sorry, talking alone. <laughs> Thank you for yeah, your patience. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, significance of a trans Asian media culture connections. Uh, so, so, so this, uh, it is significant, let me repeat, because 
various flows, not just media culture, but the capital or people. Uh, you know, it is a three very important you know component of globalization. Many scholars argue, uh, circulating and co-worked and also received, consumed within the region. So that's why East Asia is kind of very significant cultural sphere, and also various issues shared, uh, shared and historically constituted relationship are uh, still over determining the present in both dialogic and also antagonistic manners in East Asia, as I showed. That's why East Asian cultural flow is important. And also, spatially and historically, and also materially and imaginatively, or unevenly and dialogically again, uh, East Asia is connected and also related to each other. That's why we need to take East Asia serious. Cultural flow is very important. And so, that, so we need to look at the both sides. So we have focused more on the positive side, and so we need, I think, time, let me repeat, to think about the limit as well. And so how we go beyond the imagination of West-West binary, or Japan, Asia binary, and also essential notion of the nation, the region, uh, be it the Japan, Korea, or East Asia itself. Uh, we need to go beyond. Uh, uh, so that's why I think, I think thinking East Asia is quite serious, uh, very important. So this reminds me of the, do you know, uh, Asia. It's a very famous term coined by Takeuchi Oshimi in the 50s. So Asia's method. So Takeuchi is uh, it's a very his historical thinker uh, who is not concerned with the popular culture at all. But uh, he said, you know, he, when he, he, uh, he tried to think about, uh, you know, af after the war, how Japan uh, thinks more seriously with the Japan relationship with China, uh, India, and also the Asian modernization process. At the time, of course, the westernization is the most serious issue. And uh, how decolonization should be done. So he, uh, when he first time visited China, he found uh, kind of similar but different kind of things occurring in China. So it's, uh, I think he found a kind of sense of joy within him to find out similar but other different kind of things going on. Uh, because he, he had many, many Japanese things at the time. Uh, only looked at Japan's relationship with more West, or particularly United States. So this is, uh, give us, gives them a, one a certain kind of understanding of Japan's position and the problem of modernity, and also its relationship with other East Asia. But uh, he, when he moved his eyes to the interrelationship within Asia, he has a different kind of understanding uh, of uh, social issues, modernization. Etc. So, so for him, uh, it is quite uh, productive to conceive Asia not in an essentialized notion of uh, East Asia, but uh, Asia as a kind of anchoring, imaginary anchoring point uh, to consider strategically the various issues of uh, culture, as uh, modernization, and also historical development, etc. So through comparison or through interreferencing over what's going on in East Asian countries. So, uh, so this kind of, you know, uh, in comparison and interreferencing makes, uh, will develop Asian civilization, conceptualization, which uh, leads to the de-Westernization or alternative views uh, or civilization of uh, Asian modernities, which is not quite the same as the Western modernity at the time. And so uh, I think uh, as what I said today is uh, his, this kind of idea itself is uh, mundane practices by various audiences in East Asia. So Asia's method is already, I think, uh, with us. So, but the question is how we go uh, further develop uh, this uh, kind of uh, new development. So the, here comes uh, the term, uh, the, my title, Pop Asia's method. Uh, so, so the basic fundamental question is how, how we can further advance uh, cross-border dialogue in a world which so many issues are, and voices are shareable, but not necessarily or inevitably shared. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Roger Silverstone, who, is a, uh, who died several years ago, who is a British uh, media culture studies person. It's a quite nice word. I love this quote. So, so thanks to the digital, digitalization culture or popular culture cross-boundary, a uh, transgression. So, so many issues, so many knowledge, so many images are uh, theoretically shareable by anyone in this world. But uh, this does not necessarily mean we share 
something together with other parts of the world, the people in other parts of the world. So this kind of issue, I think, we need now. Uh, we are moving to the next stage of uh, East Asian or uh, popular cultural uh, connection, dialogue. So uh, from comparison, not just a mere comparison, Japan, Korea, this will sometimes result in the reproduction of uh, uh, so-called methodological nationalism. And so uh, we need to more collaborate uh, to together think about what's going on here and there, and there, how they are interrelated, actually, under the global forces of our governance, of our culture, etc. So this is, I think, quite important. And, so, and also, as I said, we need to think about the more publicness of our culture. So whose voices, whose uh, concerns are not well uh, you know, reflected or marginalized. What kind of issues are not part of our agenda by, uh, in the conception of a mutual, a mutual conception of popular culture? And also, uh, again, this is a second issue related. Uh, beyond the, we need to go beyond the methodological so nationalism. Uh, so we need more consciously, I think, try to go beyond the kind of national thinking, national outlook, which is deeply sedimented in our mind, uh, our body. So it is quite uh, need a, a lot of labor. And so, as I said, uh, other issues that we need to uh, think, combine the issue of a transnational multicultural, a symbolic and ethno inflow, outflow, which I showed. And so, uh, last but not the least, what important is, I think, this, this kind of thing do not automatically develop, unfortunately. Although we have still, all, already we have some seed of potential. Uh, developed in many parts of East Asia in the world. But we need to do some more engage with uh, how to, the question of how to promote dialogue uh, as learning process. It's not just university learning or educational learning, but a more wide, a social wide uh, lifetime uh, project of a learning process. And so uh, this is not confined, that's why, to our academic production of academic knowledge itself. So how we also engage with this kind of wider social uh, new development of a learning process. So that's why uh, this uh, last, and uh, so Bologna, join us. Let, let's do something together from here. You can do something very important, I think, uh, for today, tomorrow. I'm quite sure. Uh, so, uh, so let's advance. So collaborative project from Bologna. So, how, so by thinking about, uh, for me, uh, 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 that how can we critically and creatively approach media culture? So always critical and creative, or critical and pleasurable, enjoyable, live, uh, go together. You know, it's not you know opposite. So being critical make our sense of joy, sense of creativity uh, more, much deeper and more fruitful. And also uh, we need how we can complicate our understanding of Japan or Italy by uh, in this kind of hip pop event, for example. And uh, this is, again, uh, you need to involve some kind of more strategic uh, you know, uh, representation of Japanese culture, or well, the conception of culture in Italy, for example. So, uh, and also, uh, how to mutually listen to various cultural expression of alternative voices that reflect social culture diversity within the nation. So this is related to, I think, second question. Uh, but because there are many other issues, but I'm just uh, today, time is limited. Um, I'm more concerned with the multicultural issue, social cultural diversity within the nation. And also, uh, again, to highlight, engage with the transnational shared issue. Not Japan and Italy, but um, we need to make a much global, wider social perspective, cultural imagination. Uh, and then we can, I think, uh, conceive over these issues. And we can maybe have uh, some good uh, uh, examples of uh, how to use uh, popular culture to uh, develop this kind of understanding. So I think uh, for uh, transnational collaboration, it's imperative to advance more dialogic and democratic uses of media culture. So this is not just done by particular country, particular people. So it is really transnationally collaborative project. It's a long, long term project. And also I think this time a hip hop event, uh, I'm quite sure will be the first, and the, uh, not first, uh, one of the such a good occasion in which this kind of new kind of collaboration to uh, more, more develop 
the cross-border dialogue uh, from uh, Bologna. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you.